Hello, and welcome back to the Inside Java Podcast, a podcast about everything Java, brought to you directly from the team at Oracle that builds Java. My name is Chad Arimura. My guest today is Marcus Gronlund. Marcus, thanks for being on the show. Hi, Chad. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, when you started working on JDK Flight Recorder, of which from here on out, I will refer to you as JFR. Yeah, so my name is Marcus Gronlund. I work in the Hotspot Java Virtual Machine team as part of the Java Platform Group at Oracle. And I've been working with versions of the JFR system for a long time, going back to 2007, when I was working on the JRocket JVM for BA Systems. Before my time at BA, which Oracle later acquired, I worked as a performance engineer at Intel. So what specifically interested you in getting into uh, working on the JVM? The JVM is the cornerstone of the Java platform. It's responsible for its hardware and operating system independence. And it's also important to remember that it knows nothing about the Java programming language. It knows only of a binary format, the class file format, which contains instructions or bytecodes. And further, the Java virtual machine is actually an abstract machine. And it has a specification that is decoupled from any specific implementation. Much like uh, we have blueprints that documents a house, for example. It might sound a bit counterintuitive, but the boundaries formulated by the specification give the people who implement JVMs a great sense of freedom. So, and this is because the specification clarify expectations. They can set limits and give you an exact way to verify that behavior is correct. So it means that as long as you fulfill this specification, you can be very creative in implementing solutions. And besides that, the JVM also lets you get close to an ever increasing number of quite diverse operating system and hardware platforms. So it really lets you get your hands dirty. But perhaps the most important thing for me, at least, is that there's always more to learn and explore in this space. The JVM is really, it's just an incredible piece of machinery and really the foundation of what makes the Java platform such a success. Where does JFR fit into this and what problems does it solve? Like its namesake device located inside an airplane continuously records information about air travel. The JDK flight recorder inside the hotspot JVM records information about our programs and computing environment. So and the purpose there is to persist a history of activity that lets us go back in time, if you will. Just like the recorder in a plane enables you to understand what happened after a critical incident. The key to flight recorders, uh, be it in planes or computer systems, is to minimize the observer effect that we also know as the Heisenberg effect. The ability to record high quantities of information while keeping the overhead of the recording process low. And this is so we can also enable profiling to run always, even in production environments. Right, and I want to highlight one thing that you said earlier. Um, so just to be clear, users can absolutely use JFR in production systems, correct? That is correct. That is the, the design intent of the whole system. You mentioned a 1% overhead. That's the goal, and are you able to hit that today? Yes. We ship our system with two configurations, you could say. The one that is default, it comes out of the box. Uh, that is the, the one that is targeted or designed for this low overhead case. And it ties into some of the use cases on how we use this system. The default use case is pretty much to be used in the same way as a, a flight recorder in an airplane. You start it, you have it running in the background, you forget about it, but you know it is there in case you run into a problem. Then you know that their system is available and you can go back in time and try to understand what happened. The other setting is called a profile setting, and this is more targeted for troubleshooting information. It has a slightly higher overhead, uh, although it's still very low. And this is more for targeting uh, and analyzing performance problems that you want to solve. JFR was open sourced in 2018. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. JFR was a commercial product for many years, which meant you needed a commercial license if you were going to use JFR to troubleshoot a production environment. But the technology was always free to use for development purposes, to assist developers to understand and improve their code. And I remember it was surprisingly hard to get this message through. So many developers are still unaware of this feature even today. With the open source announcement in 2018, Oracle decided to donate the JDK Flight Recorder technology and its associated tool suite called JDK Mission Control to the OpenJDK community. 
It is now free to use, just like any garbage collector or compiler in the JDK is free to use, with no strings attached, even for production environments. For me, it is and it's going to be inspiring to see new adoptions and use cases emerging. For example, right now we're witnessing several vendors addressing how to leverage the information provided by JFR as part of large-scale deployments, such as in the cloud. So I think the decision to open source this technology was and will be beneficial for Java in general. And I think this is also reflected by the considerable interest we are seeing. So the Java platform has a strong tradition of powerful serviceability features that are built into the platform's core. And with JFR, developers and users are getting even more alternatives for understanding what is going on with their code and now also targeting continuous profiling in production environments. Um, what about the analysis side? I, I see a lot about JDK mission control. Is that one of the primary GUIs that people are using to analyze data? JDK mission control is a GUI application used to visualize the information recorded by JFR. And it can help us understand the recorded information by categorizing, filtering, aggregating, uh, letting us navigate and explore the data sets and relations. And it also has an interesting aspect that it can draw inferences to suggest changes for improvements. I thought I'd also take this opportunity to plug that as of JDK 11, we ship a small command line utility that is not at all much known, just located in the bin folder of the JDK distribution. The tool is conveniently enough just called just JFR. Although it's not a full-fledged visual experience like JMC, the tool can parse, filter, display information from a JFR recording. It provides an easy way and a quick way to inspect the recorded data and is handy, especially during event development. Let's move on to how the audience can actually get started with JFR. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so assuming you are on a relatively modern JDK, JDK 11 and upwards, it's very easy to get started. And this is another benefit of having the technology integrated into the Java platform in that you only need to add a single flag to your command line. And this flag is called dash XX colon start flight recording. What this does is that it starts a continuous recording in the background and you now have a history available should you run into problems or want to see what is going on as you run your code. To gain access to the recorded information, you will need to dump it into a file. And JFR recording file is a tightly packed binary file with the .jfr extension. And to dump it out, you can, for example, use the bin jcmd tool. You issue a gcmd command called jfr dump, and you specify a file name, for example, my.jfr. And it's important to note that the dump command is non-destructive and the recording process just continues to run. Once you have a file, you can open it in the JMC tool or use the bin JFR tool that I mentioned earlier. Now there's a quick path to this that can be good to know about, especially for development in that you don't really need to dump the information manually, uh, but instead you can instruct the VM to dump what it has recorded when it terminates. If you specify the key value pair dump on exit equals true to the star flight recording option, when your JVM terminates, it creates a J4 recording file for you with an auto-generated name in your current directory. Speaking about JFR events, how many are emitted today? And what are some of the most important ones and some of the lesser known ones that the audience should be aware of. Yes, so we currently ship the JVM and the JDK with 150 different event types, uh, with additional events seemingly always in the process of exploration and evaluation. A default set of events will be selected for you, so detailed knowledge of all the events are not really required to start using them, but I can highlight and mention some of the most common ones, roughly categorized. There's a lot of events related to memory. For example, we have a garbage collection and GC phase pause. What, one of the heaviest users of JFR are the JVM GC developers. And this is reflected by the fact that there's a lot of GC related information available and some are very detailed indeed, but these two event types provide more high level GC information, which can be suitable for the application developer. And it includes information which reflect upon GC induced pauses where the GC needs to stop our application to do its work. We also have an event called object allocation sample. 
And this gives information about memory allocations in your system, such as recording their event types, from where they are allocated, which we represent by their stack traces, etc. So this specific event is new for JDK 16, and it improves on earlier events uh, we had for memory allocation in that this event does not produce as much data because it's regulated by a new throttling technique. There's also uh, an event called old object sample, and this event is not yet part of common knowledge, so uh, thanks for giving the opportunity to talk about it here. So JFR comes with a memory leak profiler that is always running. It samples object allocations in order to track their lifetimes, and it does so in an effort to pinpoint memory leaks. And this event is issued to represent an object that may be a candidate to investigate further for a potential memory leak. Besides recording the allocation site for the, uh, for the object, it can also give shortest path to root information, which is information that details who is holding on to a reference and preventing it from being collected. There are also events related to code, such as, for example, execution sample, which is also known as method profiling, which samples the Java code running on your system. It provides hints as to what code is executed most often. So, and the sampler can report positions close to where the code was interrupted, uh, not, not only positions where there is a safe point poll, and thus it can avoid a common drawback known as safe point bias. Another common event in this category would be CPU load, which represents the CPU utilization of the JVM process. Now you can use it to understand if your application is CPU bound and keep tabs if your system might perhaps be saturated. There are also events related to synchronization and locks, uh, also known as monitors, to help us investigate latencies. Events Java Monitor Enter and Java Monitor Wait reports information about locks and monitors to provide insight into why an application is not making progress. We have also events related to socket and file I.O. and they detail I.O. operations, which can be very useful for understanding latencies involved as code invokes something external, uh, something like a database or network calls. Uh, we can use the event Java exception throw to monitor exceptions, uh, there are so many more. But uh, there are also many events that have an informational character describing configuration, settings and state, such as JVM versions, information, what options are running, and the environment and system properties. You can also create custom events. That is correct, especially with uh, the work we did for JDK 9, we completely revamped the user-facing API for producing your own events. And I think this is the next phase that's going to be very interesting to observe what happens with these APIs. And they're designed to be extremely simple to use. And maybe we can talk about that a bit later because there's a reason for its simplicity and it sort of it forces you to work with it in a way that pretty much is very friendly to a compiler. So there are 150 plus event types. You can create custom events to better profile your application. Uh, you're releasing new event types all the time. And there's a less than 1% overhead. Just to kind of hammer home the point, it seems like anybody using Java should be using JFR today, especially since it was open sourced at JDK 11 and can be used in production. Right. The value is so high just because of the simplicity. Uh, you, you turn it on. The overhead is designed to be as low as possible, which enables you to have this information available, even though you might not need it now. Eventually, there can be a problem. Or maybe you want just to analyze your code in other aspects, like what is going on? What are the constructs that I'm creating? What does the JVM do with that kind of information? Is there a way that I might be able to change the way the JVM works just because if I change a few constructs? Those kind of insights can be very interesting. The situations where you might want to not use JFR is with very short programs, like utility programs, for instance, because there's a startup cost uh, when we set up all the system with all the buffers where we record information, etc. So if you just have a command line tool utility that you run, you might not want to take the startup cost for, for doing that. But other than that, it should be used much more than it is today, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So if, for example, maybe in like a serverless environment where you have a process that might spin up and run for 100 milliseconds, is there like a standard startup time of JFR? 
a couple of hundred milliseconds, I think, which is is a bit too high for these purposes. Got it. There are ways we can we can probably improve that. It has a lot to do with the tradition of how the system has been used, and the system actually originated with uh, long running server platforms, uh, where the startup cost really didn't matter that much. So, if we want to evolve the platform, this is an area we want to invest in. Yeah. Let's turn our attention to some of the more advanced topics. Um, streaming was released in JDK 14. Now, streaming means a lot of things to a lot of people. What does it mean for JFR in particular? That's a good question because, as you say, it's a pretty much an overloaded term, at least within our industries. The original design of JFR caters primarily to application systems profiling and troubleshooting in production environments. But there's always been a steady and increasing demand for using JFR as a data source in monitoring and telemetry solutions. The primary difference in use and the engineering challenge for us is that these want access to the recorded information as soon as possible which is not easily to accomplish using the original design. Because in the original model, to consume an event, a uh, user must start the recording, it must stop the recording, it must dump the contents to a separate recording file, and it must then parse the recording file to get access to the events, which works well for application profiling use cases, but not so much for monitoring purposes. For example, a dashboard displaying dynamic updates. Using the new J4 event streaming API, you can register callbacks to run for selected event types as they appear in the event stream, letting you act on the recorded information more swiftly or live as it were. And I know the term streaming is overloaded and can mean many different things, but in the context of J4 here, we mean continuous access to the recorded data. I'm a bit excited on what we ended up with in that uh, traditional monitoring and telemetry solutions uh, you usually work using a flat data model. Uh, we report scalar values such as counters and aggregates and this is useful for detecting that there is a problem but it can be hard to get deeper insights that would help you understand what might be causing this problem. J4 event streaming uh, actually can preserve structure, which is so important for problem solving. And it can do this also for the monitoring use cases. Stream data points retain relations, for example, associated stack traces and other contextual information. And besides the traditional monitoring use cases, I think we might have opened up a few new ones as well. Just like we, for example, use unit tests to verify our program's functional aspects. If we use J4 event streaming, it will be easier to verify areas that had traditionally been relatively hard to test. I'm thinking about gaining insights into the JVM behavior itself. Uh, for example, a test system running in a CI pipeline could, for example, confirm that a newly introduced piece of code does not allocate too much memory, does not insert unwanted locks or trigger garbage collections in critical paths. Another possible use case, which is not necessarily based on streaming, but could be for production environments where events can be used to capture real data, such as customer inputs. Uh, such events can reveal usage patterns, for example, say we are mainly receiving inputs for some subset of a domain. This is valuable information because we can then act to optimize code for that particular subset. A so far relatively unexplored area, at least to my knowledge, is how to leverage J4 data as input for solutions based on machine learning. Such a solution could discover perhaps uh, a set of configuration parameters to optimize for a specific application load or usage pattern. Right, so if you have, let's say, 100 JVMs running and you want the JFR data uh, from all of those to end up in the same place, you would want some kind of a process running locally on each of those servers that can take the streaming data and process that and then push it out across the wire. So kind of a separate process that can do the wire push. Is that accurate? Now you're talking about a separate process. We do support that with the JFR event streaming API. And uh, there's uh, the API, you can actually just pinpoint a location on disk where uh, the recorded information is being generated. And this can be from a separate process on your machine. You can do between process monitoring in that sense. The other part is in process, of course, like an agent that listens to these things for callbacks. I just want to say also that for JDK 16 that we're about to deliver now, we sort of complemented this model as well, that you can actually now do event streaming across machines. This is the, the initial drop that we deliver for 16, actually builds on top of JMX as a transport protocol to be able to use, you use pretty much the same J4 event streaming API, but you can use it on a remote host. We believe that the, the, the 
interesting aspects there is that it's not really tied to JMX. It's just like it, it's convenient for us to prove the technology because it handles a lot of things like security and uh, flow control, etc. But the system should in theory, at least, be able to be decoupled and to use other transports if that's convenient. Interesting. So w- there wasn't a uh, specific JEP for that functionality in 16. Is that correct? That is correct. I think it was just handled as an enhancement because it complements the existing API that Got we it. already have. Cool. And so related to that, if you have a pretty busy application, you know, and you're a, a pretty heavy, heavy Java application, and you want to use JFR, are there best practices for managing large amounts of JFR data? Are there resources that people can go to to see? Should they be filtering events? Or like, what kind of uh, best practices can you give to the audience who may say, well, I don't know, this this might be too much data for me to handle, or uh, it might be too heavy for my particular application? Yeah, I think the industry is in the process of crafting these practices right now. Uh, but some reflections in general might be that JFR binary format is very tight and compact. It packs a lot of data and relations in there, but it is not convenient to work with. In contrast to that, the streaming API allows consumers to get callbacks with full-fledged objects representing events. Uh, So here the consumer may want to serialize the selected information in some other perhaps standard, perhaps proprietary format, and thus trading compactness for convenience. I think a balance between these aspects will need to be found, and maybe even some kind of combination. We are of course interested in the feedback from the lessons learned in these large-scale deployments and other new use cases to help us understand what we can do to improve. Right. It sounds like there's a lot going on um, and the team is busy adding new capabilities and thinking about how to make JFR applicable to, you know, large use cases. Where can the audience dial into everything going on with JFR? How can they keep in touch with what's happening with the technology? So the newest features and events uh, will enter the Open JDK master branch, JDK, JDK, once they're deemed good enough. Uh, Before that, we might have exploratory experiments in branches which can be shared with others if there's believed to be a more general interest. The main point of contact in general for JFR is our mailing list, which is hotspot-jfr-dev at openjdk.java.net. Cool. I think this has been quite illuminating, uh, and I'm sure we could talk for hours. You know, moving into you know what's next for JFR, what does the future look like for JFR, and what's kind of in in your head about where we where we go with this? Well, the immediate future involves releasing JDK 16. In that release, we have a few exciting features. Uh, one of which is called JFR Remote Event Streaming. So we built further on our investment for event streaming and that we also now add support for monitoring processes located on a remote host. The original implementation that we deliver in 16 will use JMX as the wire transport. Still, the solution is transport agnostic, at least to some degree, and can evolve to support other wire technologies. Remote event streaming is more than just listening to what is happening on a server. I mentioned earlier that the JFR file format is very compact. Well, with remote event streaming, under the hood, you get the original event data binaries transferred, and they are continuously written to a disk located on the client, similar to the way it's written to disk on the server. This will help offload monitoring onto dedicated hosts in an effort to minimize the impact of the system under observation. The JFR streaming API will work just as before, but now it's working against a local copy. And we believe this feature will help in the design and the construction of large-scale monitoring solutions. In JDK 16, we're also adding a new technique we call JFR event throttling. Uh, Some events are located in places that are very heavily traversed. Uh, Memory allocation events are the canonical examples. They produce a large amount of data just because of the paths they are located in. So it's not a problem for JFR framework itself, uh, but the end result as in terms of data sizes can be overwhelming and it can be hard to work with because of the large quantity of information we recorded. With JFR event throttling, we're adding the capability to control the rate of event production. This means you will state uh, a number of events you want recorded per second or some other time unit. For example, I want 300 events per second. And together with engineers from Datadog, 
we have constructed an adaptive sampler component that acts as a regulator, which shapes the event throughput while keeping the recorded samples statistically representative. So the first application of this new technique comes in JDK 16 with the introduction of the object allocation sample event. So this is a really good addition because it allows us to provide insights into memory allocation behavior by default out of the box. Something that was not possible previously because of the large amount of data produced. A bit more longer term, we are working very closely with the team working on Product Loom, which is a very exciting project with a lot of cross fertilization. As you probably know, one of the most challenging aspects of getting asynchronous code right is because it's difficult to monitor and profile. It's hard to track the distributed activities and perhaps even harder to present it in a good way for a user to make it easy for them to understand. And as Product Loom aims to abstract the asynchronous activities from the programmer's perspective, so will JFR in combination with Loom abstract asynchronous activities as it pertains to monitoring and profiling. For example, a virtual thread inducing an asynchronous operation, such as a socket I.O. call, will look like a regular synchronous operation in JFR. Another challenge for innovations such as Loom is how to address monitoring and profiling aspects in this new world, for example, a system running with perhaps a million threads. We think JFR can offer assistance for and good insights here too, because the fact of, that JFR is event driven. So this means that only a subset of this massive number of threads will be active or mounted, as we say, at any one time, thus creating a much smaller subset of information. And the newly introduced JFR event throttling technique is also an alternative we will explore to help us manage these larger datasets. The JFR support for Product Loom has been in place for some time, and you can try it out now using the early access builds. Awesome. Yeah, that was actually my next question. So if you want to kick the tires with Loom, you can also use uh, JFR in those early access builds. Definitely. And, and that's, I think that's one of the upshots with it because you can start to really understand and gain insight in how, uh, how it works in a manner that's sort of easy to understand. Yeah. And I think that's really important because one of the big challenges that Loom tries to solve is the challenge of monitoring asynchronous applications, I think, as you pointed out. Um, so we, we did an episode on, on Loom with, uh, with Ron Pressler and uh, one of his cats. And so um, <laughs> we'll, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, there's one question that I skipped over earlier I meant to ask, but talking about performance, something really, really cool is how the JIT compiler optimizes the JFR code for you. And so I wanted to highlight that because, you know, we talked about the power of the JVM, why it's been so important to the success of Java. How does the JIT compiler optimize for JFR? That's a good question, Chad. I think we can also use this to refer back to my introduction, where I described a little bit about how the JVM specification lets you be creative in the ways you implement solutions. The normal procedure for creating an event type and, and writing event data to JFR using the API would be sort of as follows. So we would probably define a new event type, which is a class that derives from the class JDK JFR event with fields to hold the data we want to store into JFR. To deploy this new event uh, event type in our code, perhaps we want to use it as a wrapper around a method we are interested in measuring and observing. In such a scenario, first we allocate an instance of our newly defined event class. We will then call begin to take an initial timestamp just before entering the method we want to observe. On return, we call end to take yet another timestamp, finalizing time measurements. We will then populate the fields in the event object and call commit, which is where the event fields get written to the JFR event stream. And that's it. So in summary, writing a JFR event is very simple, but there are reasons for this simplicity uh, besides the ease of use, and it is to let the JIT compilers work their magic. So we can first note that the object we allocate is not passed anywhere. It is not stored in a field and it is instead kept local. The JIT compiler has a phase called escape analysis, during which it attempts to prove if an object is local to a compilation unit, or is if it, as it were, escapes outside of this unit. If the object does not escape, there's no need to allocate it. And so this proof can be fed into the optimizer, which can then apply an optimization we call scalar replacement. 
by not having an object, the access to the fields of the object can be thought to, to be remapped to local variables. Uh, but scalarized values might not even materialize, and they are placed directly into registers by the register allocator or might spill onto the stack. This means there's a significant performance win compared to allocating an object on the heap. So JFR events are good candidates for capitalizing from escape analysis and scalar replacement in JIT compilers. We should remember not to have our event objects escape from methods. Further, the design of the JFR event API is so that you only take the cost of an event being in your code if you're actually using it. And using it means that when a recording is running and the event is enabled, some data is produced at that location. So in this respect, we can think about or compare JFR events somewhat to assertions in that you only take the associated overhead when you explicitly opt in to start using them. How is this possible? You might ask like, okay, I, I see there's an event in there. I've just written it into my source code. So another compiler optimization we take advantage of is dead code elimination. This means disabled JFR events will have their method bodies such as begin, end, and commit be empty during runtime. And where code do exist, the branches are stubbed out to return false. This is done in an effort to have the compiler see this as a dead code. And dead code is code that can never be executed or code that only affects what we call dead variables, which are variables that you write to but you never read. So the compiler can prove that not, none of our code branches are taken and no none of our code is really going to be executed. And we said earlier that escape analysis and scalar replacements use local variables instead of object fields on the heap. But with dead code, uh, these variables have no use, so they don't need a definition, and the compiler is free to remove the code related to our disabled event. That's really cool. Another reason the JVM and the J compiler are so powerful. How does JFR compare to other commercial profiling tools on, on the market? And so what would you say to someone who says, well, why would I use JFR? I pay a bunch of money to use these profiling tools that have been around forever. Absolutely, that's uh, that's a good question as well. And I I agree. There there's uh, we should not try to come across the JFR as a go to place for everything. It depends on what you really need to do. What I'm excited with JFR is sort of the convenient user. API uh, extension capabilities and the way you can actually plug in your own data points. And not only that, but you see them relate to other parts in the system. You see how it relates to the JVM itself. You see how it relates to JJDK. And even frameworks are starting now to produce their own events. For instance, I know that JUnit have just started to integrate JFR events. So they will produce events that allows developers running unit tests to actually glean more of this information that I talked about. How does the unit test we run actually affect the JVM? How does the JDK behave when we run our unit tests and stuff like that? So I think we, could, we can keep in mind that this is the long-term progression. Like you build, uh, like any programming language you build, you build higher and higher abstractions all the time and you capitalize on what we already invest in in the lower layer space, basically. So. Right. Yeah, and, and software is just so, it's getting so complex these days that uh, it's really difficult to understand how various things within your application affect each other. And so having you know over 150 data points coming directly from the JVM itself, being able to correlate that to application level data points that you create as custom events is is really powerful. Right. And and it's like I usually use the analogy if I use a platform specific profiler uh, of some kind like uh, the Vtune uh, profiler for instance, it's it's you always get surprised when you start to look at you have an you have an hypothesis, you have an idea, but once you start to see the numbers, it's like no, not really. And and that, that's always so exciting at least for me with like you you get surprised of your own uh, hunches and you can actually see what's going on. That's, uh, I think, I think JFR can be, uh, uh, that kind of system for many. People. Right. So moral of the story is go try out JFR if you're not today. So Marcus, this has been really a fun podcast in every episode. This is the inside Java podcast. We like to end by talking about the, uh, a typical day in the life of our guests. So Tell us about a day in the life of Marcus. How, how to address that kind of question. <laughs> so yeah, I do spend too much time in front of screens, definitely. A typical day is maybe spending 
six to seven hours in WinDBG debugging code. When not actively doing work, I like to read, especially philosophy. I like art and music. I also like hanging out in my garden a lot, which is not a good fit as a resident of Sweden, but it can be lovely during the all too short summer period. What is one of your favorite uh, flowers to grow? Ah, roses, definitely. Amazingly intricate patterns, like you can just not believe uh, it's amazing. Well, that's really cool. Well, Marcus, thanks again for taking the time to be on the Inside Java podcast. Thank you, Chad. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And please remember to leave us a review on whichever platform you're listening to this podcast. It helps others discover Inside Java. Thanks again for listening to this episode on JDK Flight Recorder. See you next time.